All right. So, can you can you hear me? Great. So, I think we we're ready to start now, and uh, I warmly welcome you to that presentation here during the lunchtime, and uh, also a warm welcome to the online crowd listening to that. And um, yeah, I'm very um, excited to show you some of my research. So, I'm David, and I'm a researcher at the Humboldt University here in Berlin, and I'm part of the Excellence Cluster Science of Intelligence where we look at intelligent behavior at the individual level, at the social level, but also at the collective level. And yeah, so my talk will present some insights into individual differences in behavior and how that scales up to collective patterns. Should work. Yeah. All right. So I want to start with with a little uh, picture out of a, a, a kid's book. And this is Elmar. Elmar is that, yeah, rainbow-colored, checkerboard-colored elephant. And it's a very famous book, and my kids like it as well. But I don't want to talk about Elmar. I want to talk about the herd of elephants that Elmar is living in. And here it is written that this herd of elephants consists of young elephants, old elephants, big elephants, small elephants, Thin elephants, so all kinds of elephants. They're all elephants, but they all differ a little bit. And these differences within species, within even herds, are what interests, uh, what makes me really fascinated and what I in investigate during my research. So, yeah, let's start a little bit more basic. So, what is behavior? You see some examples of behavior. You see mating behavior. You see Migrating, uh, migration behavior, predator-prey behavior, and then foraging behavior. And you see, uh, I choose a lot of fishy examples, so I mainly work on fish. I don't even work on lions. So I mainly work on fish because fish are very easy to have in the laboratory, and you can have a large number of individuals to investigate their behavior. So the thing that I want to uh, show you is that Behavior can vary, and this variation in behavior is very interesting for us. And I will explain that a little bit in more detail. So just have a look at individual A. It's a fish, and that fish was that fish uh, swim in such a round tank for four times. So we tested that fish for the swimming activity four times, and as you see, yeah, this fish it swam all the days a little bit different. That is a variation that is within an individual. No one can perform a certain behavior the very same way over and over again. So when we look at sports, for example, you, you all know that uh, many of yeah, football players try to practice penalties and to uh, yeah, be really consistent in the penalty shooting. But then when it comes really to the, uh, to the shootout, some fail that otherwise uh, have never failed before. So you can't really do uh, a behavior in the same way over and over again. You would vary a little bit. But when we look at a second individual, let's call it individual B, with also a fish, same size, same age, same sex, and this individual swam much more. And this is a variation among the individuals. First, the variation within an individual, but then the variation that is between the individuals, between certain individuals. There are individuals that swim a lot, that move a lot, that do certain things in their way, and then there are individuals that do these things in a different way. One can plot that. So what I mean is individuals differ consistently among each other. So you can always have a hierarchy of the behaviors, but they also differ within and this is what I mean, over time, you can't really do the same behavior over and over again at the same way. So there is within individual variation and there is among individual variation. And for us as scientists, we calculate out of these two terms the so-called behavioral repeatability, which is simply the fraction of the among individual variation, so the variation among these individuals uh, compared to the, uh, to the total variation. And that gives us a hint how much of the variation that we observe is really due to individual differences. 
The question now is, what generates these individual differences? And what maintains these differences? And there are several hypotheses about that. First, you need some initial differences among the individuals. And yeah, we believe that there are genetic differences among individuals. So the genes are not the same in all uh, of us. In uh, animals, it's the same. But there are also environmental differences. The environments where uh, animals grew up, the environments uh, uh, in that they were born, all these differences that were there at the day of their birth in the very beginning of their lives. But then there are also mechanisms that reinforce these initial differences to yeah, diverge. And that could be, for example, the, the social ni uh, niche specialization. That means when you are in a group, for example, and there is a dominant role and a subordinate role, these roles then reinforce your behavior. Or it means the pace of life theory, which is yeah, a fast-moving individual will find food more quickly and then can grow more quickly. And a slow-moving individual can't find food that quick, so it will grow not as quick as a fast-moving individual. And yeah, this is something that these initial differences reinforce. And my question was now, is there really among individual differences in behavior? We can call it personality. Is there personality when we don't have these initial sources of variation? It should be like this. I will come back to that uh, leadership uh, topic in the later uh, part of the talk. But uh, of course, there are, uh, animals differ in their social systems. And so uh, you will find a very uh, yeah, different social structures in a lot of uh, different animals. Sure, that, that could be uh, a reinforcing factor as well that uh, can reinforce then, uh, these initial differences. So I don't. I don't say that is uh, yeah all the factors uh, listed here. So there are many more factors that uh, then influence uh, the behaviors. Okay. So yeah, how can we how can we knock out these initial differences that we assume are there? And knocking out the environmental variability that is kind of easy. We can rear animals here, fish in very identical environments. We can yeah, grow plants in greenhouses under very standardized, very similar conditions. We can have light sources that yeah, provide the same light to all the plants. We can have fish, for example, uh, here in uh, offshore um, facilities in very standardized, very controlled ways, so that all the individuals experience the same environments. And we can knock out the genetic variability by using clonal animals. So we all know probably about this uh, clone sheep dolly, which was an uh, artificially created clone uh, some uh, yeah, decades ago, but they're also natural clones. So here, these aphids, it's a natural clone. Then in fish, we find a lot of natural clones. And what means natural clone? It means that these species uh, have evolved. 
most often through a hybridization event of closely related species. And then, uh, yeah, after this hybridization, there was one individual that could reproduce clonally. And this one individual most often made up then a new species. So you will find some species that reproduce clonally, that really produce copies of themselves. And these natural occurring clones, especially vertebrates, are an untapped resource for uh, our research on ecology and evolution and especially uh, behavioral uh, ecology and evolution. So I want to introduce the Amazon molly because that is a fish that I use as a clonal uh, animal for my research. And the Amazon molly, it's not uh, called uh, after the river Amazon. It's not from uh, the Amazon River. It's called uh, after the Creek tribe of the Amazon, the all-female warrior tribe. Because, yeah, this is an all-female species. There are no males in that species. And these uh, fish, these females, they, yeah, reproduce by making small copies of themselves. Every 30 days, they uh, give birth to live offspring that are exactly the same as their mothers, the same DNA. As I told you, uh, which is the case for many clonal species, these species originated uh, by a hybridization event. 100,000 years ago, two fish, a, uh, a female of Pacilia mexicana and a male of Pacilia latipina, they made it, and there was one individual that made up then the clonal Pacilia formosa, the new species. Interestingly, they still need the sperm of some closely related male species to trigger their egg development. Nothing uh, from that sperm is incorporated into the egg, but they need the sperm to really get the egg developed to uh, an embryo. So they're often, uh, that's why, uh, called sperm parasites. We don't really understand why the males still mate with these females, because they don't have anything uh, from that, except they might get more interesting for their own females, which was one hypothesis that was brought up in the 90s. Okay, so we have this beautiful uh, little fish, a little uh, fish that can be reared in the laboratory very well. It produces, uh, reproduces uh, by giving birth to live offspring. We know the genome, we know um, that many of the results we could find with these fish could be transferred also to uh, higher animals, to uh, mammals, and in some cases also to humans. So many um, mental disorders in humans are investigated in fish models because that is cheaper and more easily to do. So with that clone, we can now ask, is there really no personality when there are no initial sources of variation present. And what we did in this experiment that I want to explain here, we took, yeah, seven mo uh, mothers and we took the offspring of these mothers. These mothers were clones, they were identical. The offspring, identical. And we separate them uh, straight after birth. And we separate them in, in tanks that were similar. Small aquarium that were similar for all the individuals. And then we, yeah, raised them for about 50 days under the same conditions, the same water conditions, the same light condition, the same food, everything as standardized as we could do. And then we looked at the behavior of these individuals. We phenotyped them. Basically, we put them into a round tank and let them swim for a couple of times so we see how consistent they are in their swimming behavior. And yeah, our hypothesis is this. So let's see what happens. So, yeah, this is what happens. We have four observations, and here every, uh, every line is one individual. And we see there is a lot of variation going on. It's not like this. It's definitely not like this. And our statistics could prove that there is a repeatability of 0 0.35, which means that 35% of the variation we see in that graph is due to individual differences. So, yes. There could be personality even without initial sources of variation. They were, yeah, they had the same genes, they had the same environment, but still they differ consistently in their behaviors. And now, yeah, the big question is uh, when and how does this variation emerge? 
And we had to do a next experiment to really answer these questions. And we had three hypotheses for that. So first, they could be different at the very beginning of their lives. So that pre-birth effects could be critically important. So maybe there's something that makes them uh, really different at the beginning of their lives. More likely, as we saw, is that feedbacks drive the emergence of these variations. So that over time, they develop into different directions. And when we then measure their behavior after 50 days, they differ. The last case could be that there are de uh, developmental jumps when certain hormone levels uh, change during the ontogeny of the fish. And then there are certain phases in their life where there is a yeah, divergence of the behavior. So, yeah, how to investigate that? How to really look at these patterns? We decided to more or less build a big brother system for fish. So we separate the fish at the very first day in small standardized tanks, big enough to, uh, for the fish to show their uh, natural behaviors. And then we put cameras on top of these tanks. And we recorded for 16 weeks the whole day what they were doing. And that we did for, yeah, 40 fish. So we have a lot of data. We have every second of their life for the first 16 weeks. And now we can uh, look, OK, when does this variation emerge? The problem was, OK, we have this uh, huge amount of data. How to, how to analyze that? And we developed a, a small tracking software that could automatically go through uh, all the videos and analyze how much the fish were swimming and where they were swimming. So, yeah, let's have a look what happened. And here you see the data of the first 90 days. And what we, what we see here, looking at the distance moved per day, is there is a lot of variation going on. And there's no pattern that variation yeah, is getting bigger or smaller, or that there are jumps. So we find that 50% of that variation could be linked to individual differences. But what happened at the very first day? So we see there's a lot of variation already there in the very first day of their lives. And when we zoom in, we see this. So they were born with that differences. They really had these differences at, as they were born. Interestingly, we found an effect of the moms. So the offspring of mom three were less active than the offspring of mom one. And over time, we could see that the effect of the moms is getting smaller and smaller, though they developed an own personality, an own individuality, uh, individuality over time. So here is the effect of the mother, and it gets smaller over time. Week by week, they uh, develop their own personalities. But overall, the, uh, the overall variation is not changing. It's there the whole time. So our idea is now there must be other factors that influence this behavioral variation, this personality. And some ideas are, for example, epigenetic variation. So epigenetic variation, we all know that, or at least we all saw that. We just uh, have to look at ourselves. So all cells in our body have the same genetic information. The same book is in our cells. But in some cells, for example, in the si uh, skin cells, only some pages are yeah, read. And in our eye cells or our brain cells that have the same book, other pages of that book are read. So these pages that are read, they, um, this is meant with epigenetic variation. Only certain pages of our uh, genetic book are read. And that could be also the case here. In some individuals, the genes for uh, high movement are activated or deactivated. In other individuals, it's not the case. And still, they have the same genome. They're identical. But the pages that are read in, uh, from their book of genetic information, that could differ. It could also be that they choose different microenvironments in their tanks. 
that some, uh, yeah, um, out of a sudden like to stay more in the back, some go more in the front, even in these small standardized tanks. So there could be microenvironmental factors that then lead to the emergence um, of this variation. Or there's developmental noise. Nothing like this, but something that um, is there during the embryonic development inside the body of the mom, so that when they are born, they are already at this place here. <coughs> we don't know at the moment, but we want to investigate that. And especially this epigenetics of behavior is something that could be really interesting also for us humans, because we now know that um, our childhood experiences and our childhood uh, environments have a huge impact on how we act, how, we, um, how healthy we are, how we act in our adult lives. And a very uh, yeah, cool example how that really works are these uh, migrating locusts with a solitary phase. You don't even see these locusts in uh, nature when they're in that phase. But out of a sudden, by an environmental trigger, they change their whole body, their whole setup, and become uh, very gregarious and go together to uh, huge swarms, millions and millions of individuals that then yeah, can eat empty whole countries. And this is just yeah, done by these epigenetic changes that uh, change the readability of the genetic book. And we asked whether we can find evidence for something like this also in our, mo uh, in our mollies. And we tried, or we decided to use an environmental trigger that is very common in fish, and that is water temperature. So even these fish uh, live very close to the, uh, to the tropics. They have variation of temperature in their uh, environments, and they have to cope with that. So we can simulate that. And we simulated this in a way that we took sisters, and four sisters, were reared at 28 degrees of uh, Celsius, and four sisters were reared at 22 degrees of Celsius. So we had sisters raised under high temperatures and sisters raised under low temperatures. We raised them there, or we kept them there for 25 weeks. Then we put them into an equalizing treatment, which uh, means that they had intermediate temperatures, so to get rid of short-term effects, because we wanted to see whether something really is uh, changed that is fixed. And then we tested them as we uh, yeah, test our fish normally for physiological performance, how good they could swim and how active they are. And what we find is, yes, the environment can trigger changes, stable and fixed changes in these animals. They're still genetically identical, but the hot fish, those that were reared under high, uh, higher temperatures, performed constantly um, higher uh, in our swimming tests, which means that they're more active and they had, yeah, most probably also different kinds of muscle stru uh, structures that lead to that pattern. So there is evidence that epigenetic changes can happen in these clones and that might explain why they are different, even when they're genetically identical. The next step now is to look really at the genes. And uh, we can do that by taking little uh, tissue samples that don't kill the fish. We look at the trans uh, tryptome analysis, which means we look at the proteins or the RNA that is really uh, read out of the DNA. And then we can link that to our behavior measurements. And then we can hopefully pinpoint, so it's just a, a look into the future, we can hopefully pinpoint these genetic uh, yeah, areas that are responsible for changes in behavior, that are responsible for the development of personality differences. And I do that with uh, two experts from the US now, and we're at the, at the very beginning to understand how these epigenetic uh, effects and these transcriptomic differences in clonal fish really uh, work. Okay, to, to sum up that a little bit, Natural clones enable us to minimize genetic variability. So a, very, uh, uh, a high set of very cool experiments can be done with them. But these clones differ consistently in their behaviors. And these behavioral differences are there 
from the very first day of their life, so very early on. And there are maternal effects, so effects of the mom's detectable, which is strange and uh, which we yeah, can't really explain at the moment. And we know now that environmental triggers can change <clears throat> the readability of their DNA, so environmental differences can really induce differences in these clonal animals. And yeah, now you're experts on individual differences in behavior, and I want to stretch now to the collective part of my talk. You see a lot of examples here for uh, yeah, group living, and the very nice thing is that most of uh, most of, yeah, basically all animals have faces in their life where they group up. Even if you think about, uh, yeah, solitary predators like, yeah, for example, a pike in our rivers here that, uh, yeah, most of his adult life just, yeah, stays uh, somewhere hidden and waits for another fish to come to attack that another fish. When the pike is small and freshly hatched, the pike team up to groups because they're afraid of being eaten by other fish, maybe their own parents. So the function of grouping up is safety, to cope with predators. And many animals do that in certain phases. Some stay uh, gregarious, some stay in groups for all over their life, others only in certain periods of their life. But the function is more or less the same for all these. And yeah, what does it mean, cope with predators or uh, be yeah, in higher safety in a group. So there are some hypotheses that are uh, yeah, brought up to explain why living in a group is really good for you when you're living in a, in a dangerous environment. The first is a dilution of risk hypothesis. Just imagine a predator can only eat one prey individual per time. So don't think about uh, yeah, whales that eat uh, yeah, millions of millions of uh, shrimps at, uh, at once, but think about a predator that attacks normally uh, yeah, only one individual, which is the most common case uh, in the animal kingdom. And when you're alone and you meet a predator, then the chances that you are the one that uh, this predator will eat is about 100%. But when you meet a predator and you're in a group of 10, the predator will eat one of these ten in the world, so yet risk to get eaten is only one tenth. And this is a dilution effect. You can dilute the risk of getting eaten when you're in a group when the predators can only pick single individuals. The next thing is you can maybe detect the predator earlier on. Because, yeah, when you're alone you can only look into certain directions at the uh, same time, but when you're in a group Many eyes can screen the environment, so it's easier for you to detect a predator earlier on and do, you can then probably react better and faster and earlier, and so you increase your chances to survive the predator encounter. But also more sophisticated behaviors become uh, possible when you're in a group. So you can really do behaviors that confuse a predator and so lower the risk of a successful attack. And here's an example of my research from Mexico. You see a, a kingfisher, an ice vogel, that attacks a big swarm of small fish. And you see these, these water ribbles here, but you also see other water ribbles here and also here. These are done by the fish. These are done by the fish collectively diving down. They do it in a way that resembles the ola waves that we are, uh, yeah, know from uh, football stadiums. It's a Mexican fish, so uh, we also call it the Mexican waves because the Laola waves were first appearing during the, uh, I think, uh, 1986 uh, World Championship in Mexico. So they are really doing Mexican waves. And it's a behavior that helps them to confuse the predator. Whenever the uh, kingfisher sees these waves, it waits longer to attack the next time. And when the kingfisher is waiting longer to attack the next time, your risk to get eaten yeah, gets lower and lower because it can't attack in a staccato. So this is a, a nice example how uh, groups can perform certain behaviors that really distract and confuse predators. 
And the next point here is we want to understand how groups can do that. And what we have to do is, yeah, we have to analyze how individuals in groups really behave, how they interact with each other, how much time they spend with each other, how close they come to each other. Hopefully then we find some rules that they apply uh, to act in synchrony, to act collectively, to act coordinatively, to perform certain uh, types of collective behavior. And based on analyzers like this that I showed here, the tracking of individuals, there were three rules postulated that help all animal groups to maintain cohesion, to move uh, collectively into the same directions. And I will explain these rules uh, in brief. So the first rule is when there's no one around you, but you see some of your conspecifics uh, more far away, you move to them. This is, you get attracted by your conspecifics. And these, this distance that uh, attracts you, that can differ between species. So the fish, certain centimeters, uh, yeah, is enough and they uh, swim to the others. Uh, in humans, maybe uh, other distance apply. The next thing then is, the next rule then is, when you're close enough, to your conspecifics, that they are in an optimal distance to you, you move into the same direction. So you orientate with them. And that's uh, why we see often uh, yeah, swarms and shoals and um, yeah, big herds moving very synchronously. They are in, this, uh, in the right uh, distance to each other, so they orientate to the same direction. But of course, there can be the case where the others come too close. And even fish have this private distance where they don't want to have another individual to be uh, within. And so you move away when the other comes too close, not to bump into it. And with these three rules, we can really simulate collective behavior as it, uh, so it looks like a live uh, swarm of fish, a herd of ungulates, and it looks like this. This is a simulation uh, based on these rules, and you all can do that yourself. Just go to that website and try it. You can modulate the speed of uh, those artificial uh, fish. You can modulate all the zones, the distances that they have. And then you can uh, look how that changes collective patterns within this school of fish. <coughs> it's a very cool website by uh, Dirk Brockman, and there are a lot of uh, more cool stuff to explore there. But the thing is, we still have individuals. And in the first part, we learned individuals differ. In the first part, we learned a lot about individuality. And individuals, yeah, they differ from each other in many traits, not just behavior, but also size and uh, age and sex. And they mutually influence each other when they are in a group. So. You always have uh, this, uh, yeah, you uh, ask for leadership and some, uh, in some groups there are fixed leaders. In others, there are uh, leaders that change their roles and uh, individuals in fish schools and large fish swarms, they change the leader rule constantly. When someone has more information, where is food, where is a predator, and then this one act as a leader. And so they can change within the group who's the leader. They all mutually influence each other and they're not easy to control. I mean, you can't tell them to change their rules of interaction. You can't tell animals to really change how they do their social interactions. And that hampers our um, yeah, experimental uh, facilities to really test whether these rules that I uh, proposed are the real rules in these swarms. So what to do then? What to do, how to investigate individuality in swarms, how to investigate the rules of these swarms when you can't really control the individuals. So in a perfect world, we would like to bring this uh, model by Dirk Brockman into a live uh, fish swarm or a live herd. And we can do that. We can take control of some individuals in the groups. We can do that by integrating artificial animals inside groups. This is a zebrafish robot. This is a Siamese fighting fish robot that can be integrated into a group. 
And this is a, yeah, the guppy robofish that we have here in Berlin. You can, yeah, you can go and um, yeah, let this robot swim yourself in the Stadtschloss, in the Humboldt Forum. There's an exhibit where uh, you can really steer it, not with live fish, but with uh, virtual fish, but it will uh, explain you how it works. And we believe that using these artificial agents that we can integrate into live animal groups will help us to study the, um, the social behavior and the collective behavior of animals. And we recently um, yeah, summarized our ideas in that article, and there's a huge number of researchers now that try to uh, make these robots better. They're not uh, yeah, just having these more or less yeah, artificially looking uh, robots in a group, but that uh, really develop animal or artificial animals that you can't distinguish from the live ones. And so the live ones can't distinguish them from other live ones, which is a very uh, big benefit when you want to integrate them into uh, a group of live animals. And this is done by uh, Tim. He's a professor at the uh, Free University, and he works a lot with uh, these fish robots. He also developed a bee robot that could uh, yeah, reenact the waggle dance of the bee, so that A-shaped uh, dancing, and could really lead bees to certain positions around his Dahlem campus, where then the bees fl uh, flew out to find the food sources that he uh, has hidden there. All right, so how does it work? So that's me, that's a robot, and it's a tiny uh, rubber-made fish. And below the, the rubber-made dummy, we have a food, and here there are two small magnets. And these two small magnets, they uh, yeah, face down. And down below the tank, there's a robotic unit, a small cart that is uh, yeah, steered uh, by Wi-Fi. And this has a magnet on top. So you, we can couple the, uh, the dummy fish with the robot unit, and so the robot unit won't get wet. And we can then yeah, steer the robot unit through the tank very easily, and we can put live fish in that tank. So uh, in our lab, it's not looking that fancy. We, we had to go to the uh, Mayer's Museum in Stralsund to do that uh, movie. So it's uh, not that cool bluish in our labs. But it works the same way. So here's an example of an experiment that we did. We programmed the robot to just drive a zigzag path through the tank. The live fish left the refuge, and then it followed the robot first to that corner, and then to that corner. And we can, we can repeat that kind of experiment the next day, the next day, the next day, the next day. So we can test the same individual over and over again with the same social environment. Because that robot is not changing um, its behavior. We can test many individuals with the same social environment. So we can see how they differ in their social behavior. And when you do that, a lot of time, on the left, the robot uh, track, on the right, the live fish track. When you do that a lot of times with a lot of different fish, you find some fish follow very closely. And then you find some fish, yeah, they're not interested in the robot at all. And these individual differences in the social ability can be investigated very nicely with such kind of uh, non-reactive robots. But, okay, yeah, it, you would say, yeah, it's not a robot. You could uh, do it yourself uh, by uh, driving it uh, yeah, by hand through the tank. But we can also program the robot to interact with the live fish in real time. We have cameras on top that track the behavior of the live fish, and then we can tell the robot, stay close to that live fish, as we did here. Here the robot, here the robot was programmed to just follow the live fish. Keep a certain distance, drive the same speed as uh, the live fish, follow the live fish closely. And it's an yeah, autonomously driving car, more or less, with a robot dummy on top. And what we can uh, answer with this kind of experiments we can ask or answer what happens to a group, in this case a pair, when 
Some individuals are fast moving, some individuals are slow moving. And what we found here, when there were live animals that were really fast moving, the pair <coughs> or the distances between the individuals was very high. So the faster the live fish moved, the, yeah, the less the robot could uh, yeah, make really the distance uh, consistently slow. But they were all heading into the same direction when they were fast moving. When they were slowly moving, they more or less were uh, yeah, chaotically um, orientated. So the speed of just one individual in that group that was the leader in that uh, pair, yeah, really defined the collective pattern that emerged in these pairs. So the individual differences of the live fish had a huge impact on the collective pattern that we see here. Of course, that was a pair. And um, this is more a group. And our aim is now to, to integrate the robots into bigger groups, but to also investigate what happens in bigger groups better. And we use uh, more uh, or newer techniques that enable us to uh, simulate what is the fish seeing. Who's in the visual field of the fish? Because that is very important. Only the animals that uh, uh, the fish can see are the animals it can interact with. Most often that is ignored in, uh, yeah, in theoretical models. So we look who the fish sees. And we can now ask, really, has the individual differences, as we found in the pairs, an effect on how the group performs when the group is bigger? We showed it with the robot. OK, yeah, the individual has an e effect on the group, on the pair. But what happens when we use, for example, bigger pairs or bigger groups with four individuals, eight individuals, 16 individuals, or uh, 32 individuals? And that was a, uh, experiment by Alessandra and Fritz, you see here uh, during field work. Yeah, we really ask, can we, can we find out how a group behaves by knowing how the individuals in the group behave alone? And what we did is, yeah, we tested first all these four individuals in the groups alone, getting known uh, how, yeah, how much they differ, what their swimming personality was, and then we tested them as a group. We put them in a bigger tank, we put some uh, obstacles into the tank, and we observed them for a couple of times, a couple of weeks, repeatedly inside this big tank. And what we found was, okay, there is individual variation. I showed that in the beginning. The fish that we tested alone, they all differed in their speed. Interestingly, we found much higher differences among the groups. So group five, let's say, was very slow. And group, yeah, let's say 10, was very fast. And yeah, our hypothesis was those fast-moving individuals should be then in the faster group, and those small, uh, those, uh, yeah, not so uh, fast-moving individuals should yeah, be in the slower groups. And you can correlate that. And what we find is, no, there is no link between the individual speed, so the swimming uh, activity measured alone, and the swimming activity of the group. And we were, yeah, who, huh? How to explain that? And then one of my colleagues came up uh, with, a, with a study made on humans, or uh, done in humans, and he said, yeah, well, maybe the speed of the individual is not the factor that really influences the group speed. Maybe it's how the individuals interact within the group that define the speed of the group. And there was a study on humans that tested how uh, good groups of humans can solve highly complex uh, problems, so how intelligent a group is. And they also measured the intelligence uh, of the certain group members. And they couldn't find a link. So the individual intelligence was not linked to the group intelligence. But they found that the way they talked to each other inside the group, that defined how good the group really could uh, solve these complex problems. And how, how equal they shared their speech within the group was a big factor. So the more equal they, uh, the speech was shared among the group members in these human groups, the better they could solve the problems. And yeah, 
unfortunately, the groups of more f females were, uh, with more women, uh, yeah. Uh, were superior in uh, this experiment uh, because in uh, groups that were dominated by males, one male was uh, most often speaking a whole time and not allowing to equally share the speech. So similar things could have happened here, so that our uh, measures of individual speed are not the factor that really influences then the group speed. So to sum up that, individuals are often part of larger collectives, as I told you, in many species then, yeah, it's very hard to measure individuality within groups because they all differ, they all influence each other. And we can use a robotic fish to really, yeah, get control of some individuals inside the group and then investigate how groups really work. And these interactive robots allow us then to really prove ideas how collective patterns can emerge but there are several things we don't understand at the moment. For example, why is there not a correlation between individual performance and group performance? And these uh, additional factors, as I explained in that human study, that might play a role here. Okay, so I will close my talk with um, yeah, showing you a little bit um, yeah, why this kind of research is relevant also for our lives. So we're getting more and more and we yeah, we live more and more in cities. We live very packed. We live in groups. We like to go to, yeah, to watch football or uh, to go on a hutch in Mecca. We like to, uh, yeah, group up. We like to go to concerts. Uh, yeah, this event culture is increasing. And as a byproduct, accidents can happen. Many people die in these groups because there are too many people uh, at the same time, at the same spaces. Uh, they get crushed because we don't really understand how groups work. How much policemen and women do you need to control a group of humans to get out of a dangerous area or to control a group in a way that not all the people want to go through one tunnel like it was uh, yeah, the case during the love parade uh, accidents in Duisburg where a lot of people died. So knowing how groups really work can help us to make our event culture uh, things more safe. So we can really uh, increase the safety of ourselves by knowing how much people are, uh, yeah, the maximum that should be in a certain place. How many police men and women do you need to control a group uh, of humans? How many you need to evacuate a stadium in case you have to? But yeah, we have to prove that the rules that I explained for animals are also uh, the rules that apply to human groups. And that was done by uh, Jens Krause in a television show Quarks and Co. a couple of years ago. He rented a gym and invited 200 people. And they were all told to follow these simple rules. Always move, always keep an arm length distance to your neighbors, and don't talk, and don't uh, gesture what you're doing, or don't interact other than with these two rules with your, uh, yeah, with your roommates in that case. And an additional rule was that some of these people were told to go to certain places in the gym. Go to the place with the sign 1 or the sign uh, 16. So they were given information where to go. And then we can, yeah, we can really look what happened. So over time, some individuals in that group were told to go to one and some to nine. And you see what happens here. They didn't talk. They just walked. They just followed their neighbors in an arm length distance. And in the end, you get really this pattern. You can control a group of humans without talking to them just by having a certain number less than 10% of the group knowing where to go. And that is a very important insight for people that organize uh, big events with big crowds, because then they can know where and how many uh, yeah, policemen they need, policewomen they need to really make this event a safe event. And at the end of my talk, I want to show you this little clip 
I'm, I'm really fascinated by that clip. So for, for several reasons. So the first reason this professor in the US did that experiment, I think, a thousand times. And at the end of that clip, you will see he's still shocked by the outcome. So that is, that is also me when I look at uh, animal behavior. I know a, a lot about animal behavior. I observed a lot of animals. I'm still fascinated by their behaviors when I look at it. Like this professor, he's still shocked. He did that experiment, I think, a thousand times. Still, he's fascinated by the outcome. Uh, but it also tells you that tiny things can have a huge impact. Tiny differences, even among clonal animals, can have huge impacts on big groups. And that's, yeah, the end of my talk. And I thank you very much for listening to my talk. And I want to thank also my collaboration partners all over the world. Without them, it won't be possible to do that, uh, that kind of research. And I'd like to thank uh, my PhD students that uh, did most of uh, the experimental work I, I showed here. Yeah, thank you very much. And I think we can have uh, some yeah, questions afterwards. Hi. Uh, firstly, thank you for the talk. It was super interesting. Um, so talking about the robot fish, um, is there much research to suggest that they treat it as another one of their species, or is it, or is it another t fish type that they would interact with the same way? Or yeah, I guess that was my question. So when we when we first started to to investigate live fish with robotic fish, they didn't react to the robot uh, really well, so they ignored it. And then, uh, yeah, someone came up with the idea, oh, we, we, should, we should not paint eyes on our models. We should glue little glass eyes on the models. And that was the secret. So we, we asked for, for little glass eyes that are normally used for kid toys, for teddy bears. And we attached uh, these little glass eyes to our 3D printed replica of a fish. And then it, they started to get interested in that. So, that's really, uh, yeah, Nico Tinbergen to, uh, called that a Schlüsselreiz. It's a key feature that this robot has to have to get the other live fish interested in it. And uh, most probably, yeah, something in these eyes is glaring or is, uh, reflections made the fish really believe, okay, that is a conspecific, that is another fish I want to follow or I want to interact. Okay, so science is often really concerned about finding things that are true across many individuals. So what's it been like for you as a researcher looking at just the, the differences between individuals? Have you had difficulty getting funding or what's it like to convince colleagues that this sort of work is also important to do? You mean uh, because I, I work on uh, individual differences, whether that is... Um Oh no, I think, uh, I think people are really interested in that because, uh, yeah, we, we observe these individual differences in us. So, uh, yeah, we're all different and uh, even uh, twins are different. And uh, with this, uh, this kind of uh, research, I can do twin studies in a much better and much more controlled, much larger uh, scale than it would be possible with humans or other mammals. And this really uh, helps us understanding uh, yeah, how individuality, how personality emerged. And uh, this is uh, a topic that really people uh, are interested in. And uh, even if you, if you would live alone in a, in a cave somewhere, you will see that all your cockroaches in your cave will differ in their behavior. So you're always getting into contact with uh, behavioral differences in your environment, in uh, the animals uh, you live with or you can observe, and uh, also uh, with your peers, of course. So I already asked you before, I would like to ask you again, if you, if you know any studies using um, uh, cetaceans, like so um, 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 whales, or if you yourself are, are interested in studying uh, whales, because, because of our reproductive behavior, uh, the only animals that are like us are dolphins and whales. So it would be interesting to do something like matrilineal pods 
where there's like a female, elder female, like they call it like the grandmother effect, who kind of take care, takes care of society. And um, I believe it's easier to study with fish. However, it can lead to more simplistic conclusions about speed. And I agree that there are stuff like um, chaos theory, right? We have the butterfly effect and everything. And it is interesting to study that, just the mechanics. If you use fish, it's very easy. You can do some study with fish, and then you realize the butterfly effect or whatever. Um, but it's more mechanical, and I think it might lead to wrong conclusions in the sense that they are right like in the physics, but then socially, if we apply that, I think we actually made a mistake like, what was it, 100 years ago? Like Jade, Jade, how is it, Jane Goodall or other people who were studying primates, and they, we tried to use that, uh, what we learned from primates, but our behavior is very different from primates because they are very, primates are very like, patriarchal and there are like a strong male and we are so much different in terms of our reproductive uh, behavior. So I think if you know anything about whales or if you're interested, maybe you can try to do anything about how does uh, a group move with a, like a grandmother, like the orca, right? There's like a orca grandmother who leads the pot to some kind of teaches them. There's a lot of learning and tool use and everything. So if you know anything about similar studies or if you have any ideas. So, yeah, that's, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm presenting the rules that we found out. I'm not uh, the one that uh, has to judge how these uh, rules are then applied in uh, society. We can observe uh, yeah, what happens in animals and we can uh, postulate that uh, these rules uh, might then apply also to, to human groups or even to uh, yeah, to the spread of information in social media, uh, the same uh, yeah social networks that uh, we all know uh, with Facebook and Twitter and so on. Uh, the rules are part of the interactions in groups as well, and we can study how information flows within a group the same way as we can study how information flows through the internet. This is uh, something yeah we, we can look at, and uh, I'm not here to or uh, my research is not based on uh, yeah making then judgments for the society. I present uh, that's going on, and then the political leaders, the elected political leaders, they can take that information and uh, make the judgments uh, that uh, we all need to, uh, to do or to have. But uh, I'm not the one that uh, make these such uh, judgments. Uh, regarding uh, your, uh, your question about uh, reproductive um, yeah, uh, structures and differences uh, for the movement, there is a group in, uh, at the University of Konstanz that uh, works on baboons. And, Yeah, so I'm, I'm not an expert on uh, how our social system was uh, 200 or 2,000 years ago. And uh, basically, uh, what we observe today is maybe not the, uh, the, the things that, uh, yeah, the humans evolved in. Uh, so that uh, we don't really know how, how human uh, evolution went on uh, over the last, uh, yeah, 100,000 years and what uh, social systems we had and how these influenced uh, our group living. So uh, I'm definitely not the expert for that. I know that uh, in some animals, uh, the, the social structure has a huge impact on how they move and how they uh, define uh, who inter or who starts the movements. In the baboons, the, uh, they have a very uh, strong, uh, yeah, structured hierarchy with some males uh, being on top, but those males, they don't, uh, yeah, they don't start the movement. It's uh, the other way around. Uh, some females start the movements of the groups, so, and the males then follow. So no one would, would follow a baboon male in the wild. Uh, yeah, they, they are not the ones that interact, the move, uh, so they start the movements uh, most often. So other individuals that might have more information where to go might be more important, but it is highly species and population dependent. Look at uh, yeah, the pan and the bonobos. So they're basically the same species. They differ totally in their uh, social uh, structure, how they live. So it's highly uh, dependent what patterns you find on uh, the species and the population and the environment.
that these populations live in. And you always have to take all this into account when you want to make uh, yeah, inferences about uh, what your data say. So uh, I can't give a general answer to, uh, to that. So I'm not an expert on the, the human uh, system, and uh, I just know we have to take a lot of things into account to really make uh, yeah, yeah, judgments uh, how things uh, will be or how uh, things will uh, work. But we can, we can definitely uh, talk about uh, that uh, later, so if I didn't uh, really hit the, uh, the answer. Yeah, so I'm interested in the fact that you've said that this behavioral um, variation research, especially in fish, have been done before to know more about the human, human things, such as mental health. Can you maybe explain the correlation between this behavioral variation and the mental health in human? You can. Can, can you repeat? Uh, can you please explain the correlation between the behavioral variation in fish and the mental health in human, because I don't really understand. The, 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 the individual uh, and the group thing in, in humans? Yeah. Yeah, it was uh, basically, we can't find that uh, the individual speed in our fish uh, defines how the group moved, so how fast the group was. So that was uh, and the human study I mentioned, uh, they uh, asked uh, whether the intelligence uh, of certain group members define how intelligent the group will be. So they tested uh, the, uh, the man and uh, woman in these groups independently for their uh, performance in an IQ test or in uh, some more complex uh, test, and then they uh, grouped them together uh, to a group, and then they investigated whether the group could solve similar uh, tests better when the group were composed of more uh, intelligent individuals. And that was not the case. There was not a correlation. Same as we find here with no correlation between the individual speed and uh, the collective uh, speed, the group speed. And for humans, it was found then, yeah, how they shared their speech, how equally they interacted with each other, that defined how, um, yeah, how good they were in performing in uh, these intelligence tests. And groups with more females, they were more equally sharing the speech. They were more equally talking to each other. And so these groups were uh, outperforming those groups that not uh, equally shared the speech that are most often uh, dominated by uh, one or two males. So that was a case uh, for humans. And we think that similar uh, yeah, factors that not relate to the to the observed behavior, not related to the uh, speed, uh, could have an impact here. How the individuals in our fish group interacted with each other, how close they came, how, what uh, interaction rules they used, that could have made a difference that we find in the group behavior. All right, then I hope you enjoyed a little bit, and uh, thanks for coming. <laughs>